when when we got to the point last year around uh, what was it the 15th of March, 16th of March, whenever whenever there, there was, I think that's when the first lockdowns were imposed yeah. or, or something around that anyway. How much discussion was or how much consideration was given to the fact that you were going to take away people's civil rights and, and liberties and the things that have generally been considered what is the definition of the developed world? Yeah. Uh, like how, mu how much consideration was given to the fact that that was being taken away? Well, um, I think for some of us in politics, that weighs very heavily. For others, it was just simply a matter of um, they were very happy to be able to enforce those rules. Um, I think there is no doubt that uh, the public health rules, and remember that's, that's where all of this stems from, are public health regulations, many of which we simply haven't had to use for probably the last 50 plus years um, because we haven't had a serious public health issue like COVID before. Um, probably the last major public health issue was something like polio mm. uh, back in the, the late 40s and early 50s in the United Kingdom. And even then, uh, the public health rules around of that were very different and of course the general public were perhaps much more compliant when it came to the government imposing rules uh, on society and on communities. So I know people like uh, Naomi Long leading us in the Alliance Party has expressed a lot of these views inside the executive and they are views which exercise us very much but of course we've got to balance that with the whole issue of the public health and the need to protect public health and most importantly uh, the need to protect our health service because if that became overwhelmed and sadly and it's very distressingly we're seeing the exact outworking of that in India at the moment we're seeing hospitals completely and utterly overcome and without exaggeration that is what would have happened here had we allowed this pandemic to, to become rampant in the community without taking any action. But the actions which we've taken have proved very difficult in balancing liberty and freedom along with the, the need to protect uh, our communities, to protect people's jobs and most of all to protect people's health. Mm. Now, I know there's a lot of people who disagree with um... The, the measures that have been taken over the last year. And I'm reluctant to retrace those arguments because they've been had a thousand times. I, I'm, I'm keen to get your thoughts on things moving forwards now. Um, so obviously the, the, the whole reason for all of the rules that were put in place was um, like a, a balance of risk for to try and protect yes. um, the most vulnerable in our society, yes. the elderly, the sick. Um, and I think what, what's on a lot of people's minds at the minute, and mine as well, is that we've taken this level of risk down um, by a serious magnitude over the past two months or so with the amount of vaccinations that yeah. have been rolled out. And it seems that we are being as cautious or if not more cautious now than we had been previously in, in sort of winding down things when this seems to be the point at which we should be saying, go, like, get back to your lives you've all waited a whole year you've done a great job you've 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 you know taken taking some really hard things in in your stride like lack of social contact not being able to see friends and family like it's been a tough year and it feels like we're being more cautious now at the point when we could be saying okay we've the vaccination program has worked excellently the nhs has done a great job um you know even even chris witty the 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 uk um I don't know what his exact title is. He was, he said that outside is no problem. Um, essentially, unless you're in a large crowd, there shouldn't be a risk of transmission, even for unvaccinated people. So why are we now seeing, for example, in Belfast, places like the Sunflower or the Dirty Onion, who have taken on new staff, who have um, bought stock, brought people in to clean up, and now two days before they're meant to open are being told that it's not up to scratch? That okay. Yeah, that kind of feels like yeah. it's... And of course, these are public health um, regulations. These are emergency public health regulations that are being used in these circumstances. And that, that does cause me an element of unease. Mm. I, I'll be absolutely um, frank about that. We need to be moving away from these draconian public health regulations. 
right though they were to use during the most crucial moments of the pandemic, mm. but they need to be kept under constant review. And if that is daily or weekly review, so be it. And the health minister needs to understand, and, 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 and as do the scientific advisors to the health minister, they do need to understand that they are using powers which really uh, the community has accepted, but will not accept once we start to move out of this pandemic. There are issues around um, th th this issue of the bars, and it's very much of the moment. In fact, I was dealing with a local uh, hotel here this morning on that very issue. Mm. There are two aspects to this. I do understand that um, there are the public health COVID aspects around it, and my understanding is that that is now being changed back to what it was, and that those people will be able to open tomorrow. Oh, really? Well, if, if they want to. Okay. Um, but I understand that, that perhaps there's been uh, some mixed messages going out around the public health uh, COVID aspect to it. There is one other issue around it, and that's to do with the licensing laws. Those landlords or, or facilities that have opened up additional space that is problematic because if you're if you own a pub mm. uh, or or have an alcohol license, the, the area, the places that you sell the alcohol actually have to be specified in your license. So if you've identified the backyard of your pub as somewhere that you want to open up, mm. actually you have to extend your license in that area, and that is a legal problem. So there are two issues going on here. One is around the sort of environmental health. Uh, public health COVID stuff mm -hmm. and I think that can and has been resolved and will be resolved later today okay but there's a second issue and that is around additional spaces that are not currently licensed for the sale of alcohol and it may be that people hadn't appreciated that if you extend into your backyard uh, or 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 into the car park um, maybe you, maybe you block off half the car park with a marquee or something like that that isn't a licensed space and you need to have your liquor license extended to cover that. That's problematic because you have to submit designs, you have to submit uh, health and safety uh, arguments for that, you have to submit uh, fire safety and it has to have the approval of the PSMI because it falls under the liquor licensing laws and they are very strict very stringent and unfortunately they take a long time to work their way through. As as I know, speaking to a local hotelier here this morning, although they made their application to extend a space under their liquor licence some months ago, they can't actually get a date in court until June. Oh, oh. bureaucracy is uh, difficult sometimes. It is, well, <laughs> of course we are actually reviewing, reviewing the liquor licensing laws in Northern Ireland. Really? It may very well be one of those things that, that should now be reviewed in that in that overall review. Okay. Yeah, the liquor licensing law review is quite interesting um, and there are a wide range of issues around that at the moment. Uh, it's around everything from time to late licensing to um, the type of premises that can be licensed. One of the areas that I have a particular concern for are what are called tap rooms. So if you have a, a here in East Antrim, we have uh, some really interesting uh, businesses that have started up as small breweries, small distilleries. And um, the best you can do if you arrive as a tourist is you have to take the tour and you will get a small sample. But I would quite like to see, as in the rest of the UK, that simply if you go along to somewhere like Nakata Brewery, Nakata Brewery mm -hmm. that you should be able to just simply buy and, and drink their product on site. But at the moment, the law doesn't allow you to do that. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter, or sign up to our mailing list. Thanks a lot to our sponsor, ExpressVPN, the number one most trusted VPN. Get lightning fast connectivity with servers in 160 locations across 94 countries. Keep your browsing privacy safe with ExpressVPN and get a 35% discount on 12 months of ExpressVPN when you follow the link in the description below. Don't forget my book is now out and available to order on Amazon and on bookshop.org. That's Brexit, the Establishment Civil War. And most importantly, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.